Okay, so um, the book of Job um, is one of those fascinating books of the Old Testament um, that teaches us such an interesting lesson. It's a, it's a book about a, a, a fundamental story and how it unfolds. But basically, the question that we all want to get out of the book of Job, or at least everyone I've ever done a Bible study with, is why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? The story of Job is about a good person. Katinka helped us with that. He's a good person. There's no reason to assume that he's, he's done anything wrong. And yet he experiences terrible loss and suffering, not only loss of property, but loss of family, death in the family, and even ultimately his own health is, um, is, is brought into jeopardy. Um, as regards the answer to that question, I'm afraid uh, that we don't necessarily get the answer that we are hoping for. Firstly, Job thinks that God did this for a reason. When we listen to Job's speeches, and we'll talk about that, I think, uh, in two weeks' time, when we listen to what Job says, he thinks God did this for a reason. God must have had a reason. And then eventually he even gives up on that, but we'll, we'll see that as well. Um, secondly, God does not say. In three weeks' time, when we look at what the Lord says, we will not discover a reason for our, our question. We won't get an answer. God does not say why he did it and why a, a, a bad thing um, has happened to such a good person. And finally, the best that we can say from the book. Now, if we just take the book and if we just take the verses, the best thing we can say is that it was all a test. That much we can say for sure, because the story in chapters 1 and 2, culminating in chapter 42, there is a test going on. And that's why all of these things happened to Job. Um, can I also say that... Uh, we hear from Job some of the most aggressive rhetoric that is ever used in the Old Testament uh, towards God. Uh, Job says um, some of the strongest things that any character, not David, not Moses, not any of the others, had the guts to say what Job says to God um, when he's wagging his finger and when he's trying to make sense of why this has come upon him. And in chapter 9 and verse 22, uh, there is perhaps an almost heretical thing that Job says to God. And nowhere in ancient Near Eastern literature, let alone the Bible, can we find evidence of any biblical character or extra biblical character saying such a thing to their God. Um, you can read it for yourself, 9.22, but Job's anger is powerful at that point. And uh, it's, it's, it's um, the strongest in the ancient Near East. And the fascinating thing is that when God comes to speak towards the end of the book of Job, God does not reprimand Job for what he said. He tells him that he hasn't spoken with insight. He tells him that, uh, you know, you weren't there when I created the world and blah, blah, blah. But he doesn't reprimand him and say, you should not have spoken to me in that sort of tone or, or whatever. Interesting. Fascinating. Um, and I wonder whether that's because Job spoke to God with a, um, you know, with a, with a clean conscience and with a uh, clean heart. Um, so he was, it was raw emotion, but it, was, it did not have any other motive other than trying to understand what God was doing. Okay, then if we go on to the next slide. Um, in the Old Testament world, in the world of the early Hebrews, of the Jewish people as they developed from Moses through Abraham and beyond, we have a thing called the sphere of destiny. And it may be a funny title, but you will understand it when you hear what it is. Basically, the sphere of destiny is, surely God punishes bad people and rewards good people. If you look in the book of Deuteronomy, Basically, what the book of Deuteronomy says is, if you do well, then you're going to be rewarded. 
if you do poorly, if you behave badly, then you're going to reap, you know, the consequences of your actions. So basically what you give is what you get. If you're going to behave yourself, God is going to bless you. If you're going to uh, behave in a very poor manner, then you must not be surprised if you, if you experience great suffering and hardship. Okay. And then, um, so surely you get what you deserve. That, that is the, the basic worldview. And we call it retribution theology. Um, retribution theology, uh, you basically get, you know, what, what's coming to you, right? Um, and you could, you could stand at the graveside of a person in that era, and it would have been quite acceptable for you to work backwards. You could say, okay, let's see, how did he die? Did he die well? Uh, the Bible, um, the Genesis talks about he died full of years. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they died full of years. They died well. They had good, full lives. They lived to a ripe old age. They passed off into the year after without, you know, a murmur. It was a beautiful life. And then you stood there and you said, okay, well, now when we look back at their lives, we can see that they lived a good life. And it's not surprising then that God allowed them to die a good death, right? Now, uh, if, of course, the person was an old rogue, and you stand at the graveside and you say, well, we're not surprised. We're not surprised. Got killed in a drunken brawl or a chariot accident or whatever, something like that. And when we look back at his life, well, he had it coming. You know, um, it's, it's exactly what we expected uh, would happen, right? So um, that basically is retribution theology. But the book of Job puts pay to that theory. Um, it, 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 it makes that theory out to be a nonsense. Because in the case of Job, there is a valid example of somebody who lived a good life, and yet his, his um, experience of suffering is so great. Uh, everything is taken from him. So maybe retribution theology doesn't work. And it's a great example in the Old Testament of God throwing a spanner in Israel's works. God saying, nah, you think you got me sorted out. You think you understand me. Uh, you think you can control me. You got me in a box. But here I'm going to throw a spanner in the works because it's not quite as complicated. It's not quite as simple as that. It's far more complicated. Now, before we go on to the next slide, um, I just want to refresh your memory about some parts of the story. Uh, in the beginning of the story, we have our, our friend Job, and we're told that he is, he's got a perfect life. That's basically the point. He's got a perfect life. Everything uh, that he needs, that he wants, is his. He's got the perfect number of children in the ancient Near East. Seven sons was like the, the thing the, beyond imagining. Wonderful. And then you add three daughters, it becomes the number 10. In the ancient Near East, again, 10 is a number of wealth and prosperity. He's got 10 children, seven of which are sons. Um, and then if you look at the numbers of his livestock and all of his uh, belongings, they're also sevens and threes and tens and so on. It's a, it's a, it's a story about uh, lavishness and wealth. He's been blessed beyond imagining. And then there's this little word in the Hebrew called Vav. Um, so he's got all this stuff. He's got all these children, and he's got a perfect number of animals and slaves and all this, 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 this. Vav, but, and, or, it's one of those conjunction words, he was rich. So uh, was he rich aside from all those things that he had, or did those things made him, make him rich? Uh, we don't quite know um, what the author is saying. It's a very interesting little sentence construction, the vav. He had this, this, and this, and this, vav, but, and, or he was rich. Is there a connection? Isn't there? What makes you wealthy? What makes you plentiful? What makes your life abundant? Is it the things, or is it a sense of self which is stands aside from those things? So he had all those things, but he was also a person of plenty. We don't know. Okay, next slide. The book of Job is similar to many of the ancient Near Eastern stories, the Babylonian myths, uh, the Egyptian myths, but it's not the same. 
It's exceptional. There is no story quite like it. It has similarities, you know, about people who get tested and about people who have plenty and then, uh, you know, have nothing and how they, they work themselves out of it. But there's some uh, features in the book of Job that make it absolutely uh, exceptional, fascinating, some twists in the tale. Um, and I'll tell you what some of those are. The first thing is that Job pushes back against the wisdom tradition. So the wisdom tradition in the Old Testament is the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, certain parts of Songs of Song, Song of Songs, and and Proverb and and Psalms, uh, and then of course Job. And the wisdom tradition is a powerful tradition. It it, it um, has lots to teach us, but. The book of Job pushes back against it because the wisdom tradition has good advice for people. And basically it is, if you behave yourself, then things are going to go well with you. And Job says, hang on, mostly, but sometimes not. And so it introduces into the Old Testament world a series of exceptions. You know, don't think you've got it all figured out. Um, you need to think a little longer about this. The, the, the second item is that Job is a book that kind of defies dating. When you look at the book in and of itself, you would think that it's one of the oldest pieces in the Old Testament. Why do some of the commentators say that? They say it's old because Job was sacrificing. Now, when the priests came along, uh, individuals didn't sacrifice for themselves. They went to the temple. Or before the temple, they went to the high places, Shiloh, uh, and so on. And they, you know, the prophet could sacrifice or the priest. Now, Job, one of the, the, the uh, references is that Job used to sacrifice on behalf of his children, just in case they were doing something or thinking something wrong. Now, because Job is sacrificing, many of the commentators said, well, this must be a very old book because it predates the priesthood and the prophets. Um, he is sacrificing on behalf of his own family, which is a practice that stopped when the priesthood and the, and prior to the priesthood, the prophets um, came on the scene, you know, Samuel and others would, he would go to Jesse's house and have a feast there on behalf of the house of Jesse. Now, Job, it was felt that he was one of the earliest books, but then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, part of the Qumran community, uh, near the Dead Sea in, um, in, in Palestine, Israel. When those were discovered, um, a, a manuscript of the book of Job, a very old um, and one of the most ancient manuscripts was discovered. And the language in which this was written has been called Paleo-Hebrew. Paleo-Hebrew. Um, and so this Paleo-Hebrew is like, um, it's like the King James Version. It's, it's a, um, uh, a version of, the, of Hebrew that's been kind of made to look a little bit older. And so people began to say, hang on, well, maybe the book of Job was not written as old as long ago, but maybe it was written as part of the Babylonian captivity when the people of Israel were taken to Babylon after um, five, uh, 586. And, um, and then they, so as to process their grief you know, they resurrected a story that was part of the oral tradition. It doesn't really matter, by the way. Um, this the whole thing. I'm just telling you out of interest. So the Paleo-Hebrew book, part of the Babylonian captivity, to help the people to process. The one thing that we do know about Job is that it is a story. It's written in the form of a story. It has all the Hebrew markers for a story. For example, if you um, have a look um, at verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. Now, in the Hebrew, it, it basically starts once a man, and then it talks about Uz and so on. And that once a man is like our version of once upon a time. Now, this doesn't take away any of the value of the book of Job, just as Jesus' parables are immensely valuable, even although he told them as stories. In fact, sometimes... Um, biblical writers can tell us incredible, uh, communicate incredible truth by using a story. Uh, the land of Uz, we don't know where Uz is. Um, I'm not sure that anybody's found an Uz. 
it's a it's a mystical uh, uh, you know mythical place and this man called job by the way job is not a um a hebrew name so it's an unhebrew name as is an unhebrew city and the story is written and and by the way this this book is complex because chapters one and two are written in the story form and uh, and chapter 42 at the end but in the middle you have a much more complex structure of dialogue this dialogue was was uh, pretty common to the ancient near east um, if we go on to the next slide so the story of job um, we know that it is a fiction um, we also know that um, Job is uh, so that people could come to terms with their own situation, in, uh, probably in the Bab uh, Babylonian captivity. Remember the people said, um, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Which is basically what the likes of Bevan and I were saying in March and early April. How on earth are we going to sing the Lord's song in this COVID-19 pa pandemic? We don't even have... Uh, uh, the first clue about where to start. Um, so Job is written for people who are disorientated and it's going to help them work through what they're feeling about being taken away from Israel, taken away from the Jerusalem temple um, into this foreign, foreign land. So um, it's like the parables. There's a number of voices. There's a narrator's voice, um, which is interesting. Um, we, we, we don't know where Uz is. It, it may be a land far, far away. And there's no one in the Bible. Not one. Not Abraham, not Isaac, not Joseph, certainly not Moses and David, who are perfect people. But Job is pretty much, apart from a little bit of ranting and raving, he's pretty much a perfect person. He's an upright person. What does it say? He's blameless um, and and he's blameless, upright, he fears God, he turns away from evil. I, I don't know people like that. I uh, don't know very many, apart, apart from Bevan, of course. Um, and, but the rest, you know, the rest of us are sinners. And um, so, uh, let's, if we go further on the, on the book of Job, um, it's, it, the, the story begins with God having a staff meeting. That's what, I, what it looks like to me. God is having a staff meeting. Um, there he's sitting in, in the heavenly chamber and, uh, and all the angels are coming to attend to him. Now, this, contra uh, this statement that Katinka was um, kind of alluding to uh, may seem controversial to you, but, but it shouldn't be. Because in the Hebrew, it's very clear. They're not talking about the devil here. Um, if they spoke about the devil, they, would they wouldn't use an article. But it's this ha satana, uh, and ha satana means you've got it's the, and then you've got to look. What does satana mean? It's the accuser, and so basically, it's the public prosecutor. It's the uh, district attorney. Um, it's it, it's, it's a, a member of the heavenly um, entourage. If it was the devil, then you would hear about the devil all the way through the story. And not only in chapter one and two, but you'll also hear about it in the dialogues. He might even make an appearance. If God uh, addressed Job, then the devil might make a counter argument. And he would certainly have been mentioned in chapter 42. But um, this story is not envisaging the devil as we know him, uh, you know, Satan or Lucifer, or whatever. This, this story is using a word from which we get the devil, which is he is the accuser. But in this instance, uh, it is an angel who's been given the task of checking people out and seeing whether they have right motives. Uh, and basically, the, uh, this accuser, this public prosecutor, is going to question whether or not Job's motives are pure. Is Job simply uh, following God, doing what he needs to do, uh, praising God and all that, because God has blessed him? Or... Is, is it something from within? Is he going to become uh, a disenchanted when God takes away the good things? And is he going to move away? So, and fascinating also in this story in chapter one and two is that God asks questions. Um, and, and that's why another reason we know it's a story. Why would God say 
to the a angels uh, and particularly to the public prosecutor. So what have you been doing? You know, what's keeping you busy? Um, seen anything new lately? That's basically what he says. Uh, God wouldn't need to ask a question like that, but God does in the story because he's got to make conversation and he's got to ask questions and be responded to because otherwise the story would be pointless. God knows the answer, so he doesn't ask the question. So there's no dialogue. So God basically um, asks the questions. And then um, the basic question uh, that the crux of the book is, does Job fear God for nothing? Or is it just because of the comfort God allows him to enjoy? When I say for nothing, I mean with no return. He's not going to get anything for it. That is the basic crux of the story, and it's going to test uh, Job. Now, in theology, we call this disinterested piety. Disinterested piety. Now, disinterested piety means that whether God is good to you or not good to you, you're going to follow him anyway. You're, you're not a fair-weathered friend. You're going, to, um, you're going to believe in God whether you suffer or whether, you know, there's no hardship at all. Um, oh, uh, I, think, I think, you know, Job, time and time again, comes back. Um, Though he slay me, still I will hope in him. And then there's the beautiful piece. I think it, uh, is, it, is, it uh, is it Amos or Micah? Um, Bevan will have to help me here. Though the fig tree does not bud, though there be no grapes on the vine, you know, still I will trust in him. Habakkuk, uh, George. Habakkuk, ach, Bevan. You see, a man has his uses, eh? He can tell you just like that. <laughs> now, now, basically, that is what Hosatana, the public prosecutor, is testing in this court case. Will Job be able to follow God, to praise him, even if everything is taken away. It seems such a simple question, but it's a very important question. And you know, I think about myself, and I'm sure you think about yourself as well. Um, you know, I question my motives sometimes. I, I think to myself, you know, I've had a good, oh, I've had some grief uh, and loss, um, you know, things have not always gone my way, but, you know, on the balance of things, things have gone well with me. Um, you know, um, uh, God has, has really allowed me to enjoy relative comfort, um, good relationships, um, you know, um, stuff like that. Now, the question is, am I grateful because of that? Or would I be grateful if things were not so great? Um, if, if um, you know, if things had not fallen in such pleasant places. Um, and I think that needs to be the question that lives with us through this Bible study. Uh, are we fair-weathered friends? I think I, I used this illustration in a sermon or one of the other Bible studies I recorded. I remember once preaching um, in Johannesburg at Linden Presbyterian Church. I was a guest preacher and the minister was there. And uh, he, he was leading the worship and all that. And I sat in the front next to an, an elderly lady. Uh, it was a very dark and rainy day in, in, uh, in Johannesburg. I think it was a winter's rainy day. And um, at the beginning of the service, he said, well, won't you speak to those around you and, and tell, you what, tell them what brings you here today? Well, for me, it was a very quick answer. I said, well, I'm the preacher. You know, that's what's brought me here today. And then she turned to me and she said, you know, when I woke up this morning, it was so dark and the rain was falling so hard, it was cold and I was really tempted to stay in bed. And then I thought to myself, this is what she said. Then I thought to myself, God never let me down on a rainy day. And boy, oh boy, that flattened me. I didn't know what to say to that because it was such a beautiful uh, thing to say. God never let me down on a rainy day. And that's, that's how I try to feel, you know, any time when, you know, things are not quite as they, uh, as they ordinarily are. True love, um, according to Jesus, um, is, is exemplified uh, by the Greek word agape. And there are many words for love, and I'm sure you know them all in Greek. 
but the word agape is selfless. It is um, a love that, uh, that cannot be, uh, does not need to be uh, reciprocated. It is given uh, freely and generously. And if you don't reciprocate, that's, that's fine. It's, it's not required. Um, so a couple of little things before we um, conclude this section. Um, and uh, firstly, uh, that verse that I, I, um, I suggested to you, when Job uh, thinks about his children, we're not given to believe that his children were bad in any way or sinful or evil, but he sacrifices just in case there might be something that happens there among his children, even in their thoughts. He sacrifices. I mean, how good is that? And then, um, so the basic storyline of the book of Job, as I've ex uh, explained to you, is that um, God and the angels are having a conversation in the staff meeting. And then one day the angels come and present themselves and also the accuser or the public prosecutor. Um, and it's not a fight between good and evil. God has not got an adversary in the story. There's not a, a good God and an evil Satan. No, it's one of his own staff. And this guy says to him, ah, oh, you know, I've been looking at Job and uh, possibly, possibly if, if things were different, Job might react in a different way. Um, does Job fear God for nothing? That's the main um, question. And I want to come back to that question very briefly. Because you must remember the Canaanites worshipped for a reason. Uh, when you read about Baal and Asherah and so on, the Canaanite gods, the people worshipped with a particular purpose in mind. If you wanted your sheep to uh, flock to grow, if you wanted your cattle herd and goats and all these things to grow, then you worshipped Baal because Baal was a fertility god and the, the animals would multiply and it would be a good season. If you wanted your crops to be fertile, you worshipped Asherah. She was the, um, the goddess in the Canaanite tradition. So you had a purpose. You wanted something, you worshipped them, you sacrificed to them, they gave it to you. It was the same with the Greek and Roman gods. They needed to be placated. You went in front of Zeus, you went in front of Hera, all these pagan gods. You did something, they gave you something back. Now, in this instance, we're dealing with a question not of placating a God, um, not of doing something. Well, the thing that's being tested is whether this God will react uh, to Job um, the same way if Job wants something or if he doesn't want something. Or is Job big enough? Is he religious enough? Is he faithful enough um, to be able to worship this God, even if he gets nothing in return? That's the big question. Um, and then... Let me just get my notes here. Yeah. So um, in verse 13, uh, we see a, a collection of things happening. You know, the, the, the crops are taken away and the you know, property is destroyed, the sons and daughters. And it's interesting, if you look at verse 19, um, it's also a fascinating thing there. A great wind struck the house, right? Now, the, the word wind in, in Hebrew is ruach. It's a similar thing, you know, with Greek you have pneuma, and it, it means wind, it means breath, it means spirit. The Holy Spirit is pneuma, agios pneuma, right? So now in the Hebrew, it's ruach. The ruach came and knocked the house down. Well, uh, I mean, that really, for the Hebrews, they would have known who knocked the house down. God knocked the house down. It's not evil. Ruach knocked the house down. And this is why Job says later, the Lord gives and he takes away. The Lord took the children away. Uh, you can't blame it on evil. It's there in the Hebrew. The Ruach came, the house fell down. And then, as if to make sure you understand who knocked the house down, there is a word in Hebrew that means struck. He struck. And it's used for the hand of God. God struck the house down over the kids. Now, can you imagine how traumatizing that must have been in the story? that the good and benevolent Yahweh is the one who took it away. Well, Job understands it, but for the reader, uh, for, for the hearers, it's a big shock to realize the house wasn't just knocked down. God took them away. He gave and he took away. Um, and then the other little thing I just want to uh, mention to you, which is significant, 
if you look at um, chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And in the Hebrew, there is the, he didn't say anything against God, and he didn't think anything against God. That's the first round when he lost everything. But now, if you look at the second round, and this is in verse 10 of chapter 2, in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Now, the storyteller is very clever. He's not saying Job didn't think badly that second time around. The first time around, he was fine. Okay, you've taken my property my livestock, my servants, you've taken my children. He didn't sin in his mouth. He didn't sin in his, in his mind. But in verse 10 of chapter 2, after he's got to scrape his skin with bits of pot, you know, he's got sores all over and so on. Then the writer says, Job did not sin in what he said. He didn't say anything. But the writer is not saying whether Job didn't think anything. It's a very different sentence. And I don't know if you would have seen it before. I just wanted to point it out to you. It's a fascinating part. Good. All right, then. Um, okay, so that's basically uh, the section I wanted to talk about. Let me just summarize now at the end what we're going to do from here on in. Um, so this week, we really were interested in looking at the prologue, the story of Job. And I asked you to read in, a, in anticipation uh, one and two, and then the very end part. But for next week, um, Bevan is going to be leading, and he's going to look at what the friends say. Now, this middle section is the most complicated part of the book of Job. So we divided it in three. So next week, we're going to talk about what did the friends say. And then I put in there, my, one of my teachers at school used to say, listen, if you want to have a question, please ask me, the teacher. Don't ask each other, he said to us, uh, you know, children in the class, because you're just going to be pooling ignorance. So with the friends of Job, are they talking sense or are they just pooling ignorance? We're going to consider that, that question. And then in two weeks' time, we're going to look at the second part. What does Job say? Uh, and in these passages, chapter 6 and 7, 9 and 10, 12 to 14, 19 and 23, is Job speaking to his friends? Or is he speaking to God? Who's he speaking to? Uh, and we'll look at that um, very carefully and say, is, is Job making sense? Who's he talking to? What's he talking about? Is it going to help in the end? And then in the third week, uh, Bevan will have a look at what does the Lord say? From chapter 38 to 42, the Lord is speaking. What is he saying? What's the content? And what is he making an argument? Is he discussing? Is he explaining what he do has done? Uh, is he making more sense? Does Job need to understand? And then finally, in the last week, we're going to bring it all together and we're going to reflect on the basic story again, chapter 1 and 2 and 42. And we're going to talk about the dialogues and how they fit in. Uh, and we're going to look at Job's words and the Lord's speech. And we're going to try and bring it all together and work out for ourselves, what does it have to teach us, we who live in a world like this, and particularly maybe the current context that we find ourselves in. Um, and then, um, you know, is it, is it going to help us uh, in terms of COVID-19 and the suffering of the world and the devastation that some people's lives, you know, are reflected in some people's lives and so on. Good. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's get you all back on the screen there. Okay. And unmute you. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts? Questions, comments, thoughts? Anybody? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Oh, there's a lot of people. Why don't you just check, uh, before you speak, Jean, just check your muting. Sometimes we can't unmute people. But I see here at the bottom of the list, there's lots of people that are still muted that might not want to be muted. I'm unmuted, I think. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Jean. No, I was just thinking about um, Job and you know, when he still turn to God during troubled times. I think in our lives, that is when we really turn to God. Most people 
turn to God during troubled times. I mean, if they've never even worshipped God, a lot of people will then reach out for God during troubled times. Okay. So that was just my thought on that. Yes. So Jean is and, saying that, that often it's only in troubled times that people turn to God. So, so they, yeah. they kind of, when they really need him, uh, they get in, you know, get in touch with him. Um, and yeah, I guess that is the basic story because, um, you know, when Job needs God, the Satan, the, the accuser is saying, Job, you need God and that's why you're faithful. But uh, the fact is that if he took away from you his presence, which is his blessing, then it'll be a different world. Carry on, Jean. And then the other thing we used to, um, when Job was um, making sacrifices for his children in case they uh, sinned, uh, isn't that why we pray for our children? Not just in case they sin, but to keep them safe from sin. So today, instead of sacrificing, I think prayer has been, it's been sacrificing has been replaced by prayer in a big way. Yes. That's all I was thinking. Great. No, that's very helpful. You're right. Um, sometimes we, we intercede on our children's behalf or on behalf of our families. Um, yeah, the prayers of the, especially the prayers of the mothers, both in the Jewish tradition and in our own tradition, you know, a mother's upholding their children in prayer. Of course, fathers do it too, but that, that that's often happens. Any other thoughts, anybody? <coughs> Any other questions and thoughts? Yes, yes. Oh, we're <laughs> Is there anything that was new for you um, today as we started the introduction on the book of Job? Something you hadn't picked up before? I didn't realize that uh, Job was actually a, is fiction, not, not actually considered to be a real, you know, um, literal story. Yes. Yes, that is, um, that's interesting. Um, and of course, just to remind everybody, the reason for that is one, it's in the, uh, in the, um, the words, the text, the, the once upon a time equivalents. And also the, uh, the, another, another interesting reason is um, that uh, Job is not a Hebrew name and Az is not a Hebrew city. And so you get this, we're going to talk about a foreigner far away because if we talk about, you know, um, <laughs> if we talk about Jaime over here in Jerusalem, then it's too close for comfort and you people will, will, will get a bit uh, uncomfortable. So let's talk about that chap over there called Job and he's in a foreign city called Uz. Mm -hmm. Anything else new? Okay. The devil. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But Satan is the prosecutor, yeah. not oh. the devil. Yes. Um, so again, it's the um, it's in the language. It's the article, the ho, uh, or the, is it ho ha? I don't know. Ha ha satana. Um, so um, you know, the devil wouldn't have been addressed with an article, and in any case, he doesn't behave like a fully fledged devil in the Old Testament would do, um, and certainly not one by the New Testament era. So, and why would he be among God's, uh, well, early commentators did say that, look, the devil was the angel of light and so on. This is before he turned really bad, but it's probably, his behavior is probably more consistent with somebody who's been given the job of, um, of checking out the veracity of faith. Yeah. Anything else? But George, mm. when God asks, where have you been? He says, hither and thither. He's yes. been quite devious. You're yes. Saying where he's been. yes, yes, you, you can't pin him down. <laughs> That's true. That's what happens when I ask Bevan where he's been. He says, Oh, well, here and there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, George. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you are Bevan. <laughs> I'm only joking, man. <laughs> oh. Yeah, he's a bit of a, a scaly character, this one as well. He doesn't quite say where he's been. <laughs> okay, what else do you see in the book of Job? Any, any, any other interesting points? 
I find it interesting that the Hebrew word referred uh, uh, relating to God is to strike or struck. So if anything, God God's hand will strike. So yes. uh, if anything goes wrong, they would have described it with um, a thumb or anything being struck down or yeah. you know. And that means it was a hand who did that. Who dealt yes. you with the deal, you know? And that, but that is more especially when it comes to that house. Um, and, and of course, yeah. Job, Job's body as well, he's struck with, you know, sores and things like that. But yeah, it is an interesting thing. And um, look, the, the early you know, Hebrews believed that um, everything was in God's hands. Even if the devil did it, God allowed him to do it, which is, of course, true. Mm. You know, there's nothing that any... Uh, that the devil can do that God doesn't allow. But sometimes we need um, something, you know, a, a place of difficulty to come right, you know, to come to our senses, like the prodigal son sitting among the pigs. You know, he comes to his senses. Anybody else? I'm also surprised that, he, that Job's wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he didn't listen to her. Now, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I wasn't going to say anything, but there's something in the language there that is fascinating. Um, Job's wife, chapter 2 and verse 9. Um, the, the, the English translation is not necessarily, I mean, I don't read Hebrew, but I was, I've been reading a lot of uh, transliterated versions in preparation for today. Um, basically, what she says to him is, you are still persisting in your integrity. You are still persisting in your integrity. And basically, she's quoting God. If you have a look uh, a little bit earlier on, um, God talks about Job having integrity. So Job's wife quotes God, and she says, you are still persisting in your integrity. And then when the translation is curse God and die, that may very well be a, um, a euphemism because the word that is used for curse is actually bless. I didn't want to mention it because it's a bit difficult to get your head around, but she's saying bless God and die. It's like when the people in the American South says, uh, you know, when you say something and they say, bless your heart, they're not blessing anything. They're saying, please don't say that or stop talking about that. You know, it's the opposite. Um, but then, when she says, curse God and die, Job's wife is also quoting, but this time she's quoting the prosecutor. So Job's wife, if you look at the text again, and you should read through chapter 2 again, Job's wife is just quoting God in the first instance. You are uh, persisting in your integrity. And then she's quoting the prosecutor, curse God and die. She's actually not using her own words at all. It's interesting. So who would have written this? Would it be one of the prophets of the day? Would it have been a woman? <laughs> I don't think it would have been a woman. Uh, sadly, you know, women in those days weren't te to, taught to read and write. Um, but uh, so it would probably have been a, a man writing the story. But you know, it may have been oral tradition. It may have been a story people told each other. Um, so basically, mm. this person who ever wrote it was writing at the end of a long process of the story being told to your children and so on. It was a lesson, you know, at least the first two chapters and the last. Um, and then probably when they wanted to get complicated, they would, they would bring in the dialogues. So, so that's, when it, that's how it probably got written down from oral tradition, like the rest of the beginning of the Bible. Any last questions? Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Great. So, um, Bevan, is there anything you want to say about next week? If anybody has any material on the book of Job, please send it to me. Nobody's going to do your job for you. You can Google it, Bevan. What's that? You can Google it. 
<laughs> yeah, my my Hebrew isn't as good as George's, you know. <laughs> George doesn't have any. Where's Peter? I'll see. I'll I'll take three points and embellish. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we will send you, as usual, your worksheet uh, to have a look and your pre-reading on Monday. Um, and just look at it. It'll be the same uh, a Zoom thing as tonight. So you'll just click on the same link. It'll bring you to the same place. And remember, we open it up at quarter to seven, and then we, we put the, the screen on, and hope maybe next week we'll have some music in the background. And then at seven o'clock sharp, we, we open up and we do the greeting and so on. Okay? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Very nice. Thank, Thank you, everybody. So lovely to see you. Very nice. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.